Hello everyone, my name is Tibor Gruhl. I'm professor of ancient history at the University of Page, Hungary. In this presentation I'm going to show you how to work with an ancient Jewish inscription written in Greek. Don't worry, the text will be easy. All you have to know is the Greek alphabet. Follow me. The inscription has already been published in the good old CIG, which is the Corpus Inscriptionum Judaicarum, edited by John Baptist Frey in 1936. And in the GIWA, which was edited by David Noy in 1995. The first question is, how do we know that this inscription is Jewish, that it was written by or for a Jew or Jewess? Well, the answer is self-evident. There is a picture of menorah at the bottom on the right, which is the single most popular symbol of Jewishness in antiquity. Moreover, the deceased is called a Jewess or Judaia in the second line. The menorah is described in the Bible as a seven-branched lampstand made of pure gold and used in the Temple of Jerusalem. The menorah has been a symbol of Judaism since ancient times and is the emblem on the coat of arms of modern state of Israel. The fate of menorah used in the second temple is recorded by Josephus, who states that it was brought to Rome and carried along during the triumph of Vespasian and Titus in 71 AD. The base relief of the Arch of Titus in Rome depicts a scene of Roman soldiers carrying away the spoils of the Second Temple, in particular the seven-branched menorah or candelabrum. For centuries the menorah was displayed as a war trophy at the Temple of Peace in Rome built by Vespasian. It was still there when the city was conquered by the Vandals in the 5th century, in the middle of the 5th century. As I mentioned above, the menorah was the single most popular symbol of Jewishness in antiquity. Its representations can be found on Jewish coins, column capitals, synagogue mosaics, graffiti, every kinds of vessels and even on bread stamps. Let us turn back to the inscription. Our first task is to make the diplomatic transcription of the text. Fortunately, the letters are clearly readable. Epsilon, nu, theta, alpha, kappa, iota, tav, epsilon, alpha, mu, mu, Iota, in the second line, Alpha, Sigma, Iota, Omicron, Y, Delta, Epsilon, Alpha, Alpha, P, Omicron. In the third line, Lambda, Alpha, Delta, Iota, Kappa, Iota, Alpha, Sigma, Eta, Tav, Iota, Sigma. And in the fourth line, Epsilon, Zeta, Ita, Sigma, Epsilon, Nu, Epsilon, Tav, Ita. And we can find some strange characters in the last line, plus the P and Epsilon, which means numbers here. We are lucky because the inscription is complete. Nothing is missing from the text, and there are no abbreviations except for the numbers in the fifth line. So, in the addition of the text, we find the first line as entha kite ami, the second line as judea apo, in the third line ladikias hetis, in the fourth one etzisen ete, and pi epsilon. Let us try to understand the text. The inscription begins with a formula which is well known in Jewish epitaphs. The female name Amias was quite popular among the Jews in Asia Minor. 
And here we find the ethnic or religious self-identification, Judea, that is Jewish. Entha means here, it's a demonstrative. Kite comes from Keitai, uh, which means to lie. Amias is a female name. And Judea comes from Judaios, Judaia, Judaion. It's a feminine adjective. The next phrase refers Amia's place of origin, Ladikia, that is Laodikea. It is quite frequent that ancient Jewish inscriptions refer to the geographical origin of the deceased. Unfortunately, we do not know why Amias moved from his hometown, from her hometown, to Rome. She might have had a lot of different motives to do that. But which Laodicea is mentioned in the epitaph? Although many Jews lived in Syria, it is much more plausible that Amias came from the Phrygian town than from the port city of Syria, or from Laodicea Combusta, or from the tiny village in the Lebanon called Laodicea Cabiosa. At first, the Jewish community is well attested in the Phrygian Laodicea from the 1st century BC down to the 6th century AD. Moreover, the name Amias is much more frequent in Asia Minor than in Syria. The closing formula of the inscription refers the lifespan of the deceased. Amias lived a long life. She died at the age of 85, which is an extraordinary long lifespan in antiquity, especially for a woman. The P epsilon in the fifth line with a short line above the letters indicate that these letters have numerical values. You can check on this chart that the numerical value of the P is 80 and of the epsilon is 5. Thus, the number is 85. Now we are able to put together a proper translation. Here lies Amias, a Jewess from Laodicea, who lived 85 years, and a menorah. But the job is not finished yet. At the bottom of our inscription we can see three strange characters. To be honest, they have never been successfully explained. The latest edition of the inscription in the GIWE says that, I quote, the Hebrew letters show close similarities to the Hebrew at Beit Sharim, although admits that the letters were said by some to be Nabataean or Palmyrene. David Noy's conclusion, I quote again, the word is a slight misspelling of the Hebrew Shalom. But are these characters really similar to the Hebrew ones? I don't believe that. Even if the Hebrew letters, most often in the Shalom closing formula indeed, were distorted on the Greek inscriptions, they show some similarity to the original ones, like on these two Jewish inscriptions from Rome. You can see here Shalom in Hebrew letters, and you can see on the above inscription from Sarcophagus of Faustina, and on the Monteverde catacomb, that this is somehow similar to Shalom. In my opinion, we don't have to be trained epigraphists to establish that these characters have nothing to do with Hebrew. I cannot imagine such an awkward stone cutter who would mess up so much Hebrew letters, even if he didn't speak a word in Hebrew. I'm quite sure that these letters are not Hebrew, but Palmyrene, probably Resh, Tzade, and Het. But, honestly, I cannot explain it. My best explanation is, for the time being, that the stone cutter in Rome was Palmyrenic, and he tried to sign something, perhaps that the old Jewish lady was killed. But it is just a fiction because the resh, tzade, and het, ratzach in Aramaic, means uh, kill someone, or murder. 
Finally, I put some thrill-provoking questions. What are the proofs that Amia was a Jewess? Which Laodicea might she have moved over to Rome? What do you think of the three strange characters at the bottom of the epitaph? If these letters are Hebrew, how could a normal stone cutter distort them so much? If these strange characters were written in Palmyrenic, how could explain this phenomenon? Thank you very much for your attention.